Many would agree that the most obsolete part of the iPod is the 30 pin connector that's used for charging and data transfer. While I could remove it and in its place install a USB Type-C connector, that would mean I would lose access to a large array of made for iPod accessories. And one of the things that makes the iPod so special are those accessories. That's when I got the idea to implement wireless charging into my iPod. That way I can retain the functionality of the 30 pin connector as well as have the option to easily charge my iPod on the go. Wireless charging, it's slow, inefficient, unnecessary, but you can't deny it looks pretty damn cool. It's been a staple feature of many devices for years now, from smartphones to toothbrushes. But what about the iPod? Why doesn't it have wireless charging? Well, for starters, when the last generation of iPod Classics released, the Qi wireless charging standard had only been around for a year, and was yet to be incorporated into any significant products. But not to worry, there were some third-party wireless charging options for you masochists out there. Uh. What? But that's not what I want to show off in today's video. I want full fat internal wireless charging, just like on a smartphone. The biggest roadblock in this plan is of course the stainless steel back. You see, wireless charging doesn't work through steel. Hence why pretty much every single device with built-in wireless charging is either made of glass or plastic. Now, I could just 3D print a plastic back out of any color PLA of my choosing. But to be honest, that looks kind of cheap. That's when I got the idea. What better symbolizes the early 2000s more than transparent technology? I'm looking at you, iMac G3 in Game Boy Color. I don't own a resin printer, but there are plenty of printing services available online. I found this 3D model made by Dynexis on Reddit and they graciously provided me with the CAD files so that I could modify it to be resin friendly. After a while of dicking around in Fusion 360, I managed to get the model into a state where it should print well on a transparent printer. I gave it some extra rigidity by adding support around the entire back of the frame. After clicking upload and waiting approximately two to three weeks, my transparent iPod backs arrived. Okay, first batch, didn't go as planned. This is not transparent. This is junk. But not to worry. After locating a different manufacturer, this time around I went with Zelta 3D, I once again had a pair of iPod backs on their way. While not perfect, the second batch was leagues better than the first, and was all I needed for my use case. Now that I have all the parts I need, I can get to work on dismantling my donor iPod. As you can see, I've started to amass a small collection of iPods. Here's a couple. For this project, I decided to go with the iPod Classic 5th generation, as it is the easiest to open and is known for having the best audio quality. The first thing I have to do is completely disassemble the iPod. I start with an iFlash pry tool and work my way around the frame until both halves are separated. Once separated, I can unplug the hard drive and audio flex cables from the device. With the back plate out of the way, I unscrew the six Phillips head screws securing the front plate to the chassis. With a bit more prying, the front plate lifts off with little trouble. Next, I unplug the display from the logic board and place it face down back into the front plate to avoid it from collecting any dust. I can then pry out the logic board and disconnect the scroll wheel flex cable.
With the logic board free, I connect my multimeter to the ground and VCC pins of a cut USB cable, and run the other end down the pins of the 30 pin connector on the iPod. Using this method, I can identify which pins on the logic board are responsible for ground and charging. To do this, I had to remove a protective cover on the connector. Ensure you do not plug anything in while the cover is removed, as you will damage the delicate pins inside, since they no longer have anything to support them. Once the ground and charging pins were discovered, I applied some flux and delicately attached some jumper wires. With the jumper wires soldered on, I temporarily secure them with some blue tack. Next, I connect some wires to the battery connector. These will provide power to the Bluetooth module. I won't go super in depth on how to add Bluetooth to this iPod, but if you are interested, please click on the card above to watch my other guide, which goes into more detail of the process. With all the soldering on the logic board complete, I get started on painting the chassis. Since this iPod will be inside a fully transparent case, I thought spray painting the dull interior would make it look more pleasing. Once dry, I can reinsert the logic board into the frame. I route the wires through so that they are both fastened and protected between the logic board and the metal of the chassis. Some paint should be scraped off of the metal, so that the grounding pad of the logic board can have a proper connection. I then align and connect the new transparent click wheel. Now the transparent front panel can be prepared. Mine shipped with this foam gasket around the display. I removed it as personally I think the device looks better without it. The logic board can now be clipped into the front panel and the display plugged in. In my previous iPod video, I never went into much detail on how to remove the Bluetooth board from the Tautronics TTBA07. The process is quite straightforward. First, the plastic cap must be removed with some prying. Then there are two screws which you can access. Once those screws are removed, the insides of the Bluetooth module should pull right out. Now that the board is exposed, I can delicately remove the battery. I then use a pair of cutters to remove the headphone jack. You must be very careful when doing this, as it's quite easy to rip the pads off the Bluetooth board. The micro USB port can also be cut off. Don't worry about ripping off the pads here, as we won't be soldering to them. I then connect the two wires from our battery connector to the battery pads on our Bluetooth board.
I use some blue tack to keep the module in place as I work. I then test with a battery connected to ensure that the Bluetooth module powers on. Next I solder some audio wires to the headphone jack, as well as the Bluetooth module. Again, a link to the wiring diagrams as well as my previous video are in the description below. The iFlash card can now be prepared. The top of the iFlash must be removed in order for it to fit alongside the Bluetooth board inside the iPod. Not to worry though, there are no traces or components on this part of the board. I removed the pairing switch from our Bluetooth transmitter. Our new switch can be connected to these pads once we're done. The two wires tapped into the 30 pin connector can now be soldered to the wireless charging board. Nothing better than some midnight spray painting, except instead of a bus stop or some old lady's car, I've decided to spray paint the 3000 milliamp hour battery pack to make it look nicer inside the iPod. Once it's dry, the wireless charging coil can be adhered to the rear of the battery. In my case, I needed to space the coil approximately 5mm away from the battery for it to function properly. Some Kapton tape can be used to secure the wires in place. Next, I added some adhesive foam strips to the iFlash card. The battery can be stuck directly on top. There we go, almost done now. One thing from my previous iPod that I wasn't super happy about was the system I used for the pairing switch. I used hot glue to hold the pairing switch button in place, but on a transparent iPod, hot glue doesn't look great. With the iPod CAD file, I was able to easily design a small bracket that can be glued in place and used to support the pairing switch. A short print later and the switch was ready to be installed in my iPod. I insert a pre-soldered pairing switch into my bracket and then glue the bracket into place with the hold switch installed loosely. While that's drying, the headphone jack can also be glued into place. Once the glue is dry, we can give our hold switch a test. As you can see, it's clicking in just as expected. The pairing switch can now be soldered to the pads on the Bluetooth board. Now plug in the headphone jack flex cable and the iPod is ready to be sealed up. All right, that's everything. There's only one thing left now, and that of course is the obligatory tech montage.
Thanks for watching. A lot of work went into creating this video, so it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe, as well as share with others who might be interested. If you have any questions about this iPod, feel free to ask in the comments below. I respond to most questions provided they haven't already been answered in the FAQ listed in the description. If you'd like a transparent iPod back of your own, good news! I'll be giving away two of them by October 20th. All you need to do to be eligible is to be subscribed to my channel and comment below with what mods you plan on doing on your own iPod. If you're selected, I will reply to your comment letting you know you've won. A big thank you to Christopher from eBay for supplying many parts used in this video, as well as Dianexus from Reddit for the CAD files of the iPod back. Take care out there. I'll see you next time.